Hi, everyone. I'll just check you can hear me. It sounds amplified to me, so that's great. Um, a big welcome and a huge thank you for coming today. My name's Chris. I'm head of the Commission on Health and Prosperity at IPPR. Uh, for those that haven't seen the Commission on Health and Prosperity, it's been set up to explore all the ways in which health is a keystone in prosperity. So challenging that idea that illness is a cost to be contained, that health is some kind of bean counting exercise on a treasury spreadsheet that's only opened and dusted off once a year. Um, so excited that you're all joining us in that conversation. I think this is a topic uh, in, in breaking the junk food cycle that's integral to that. Um, so I'm really pleased to be joined by what I think you'll agree is an excellent panel. Um, I'll introduce the panel. I'll give a little bit of provocation. We'll hear from the panelists, and then we'll do a little bit of question and answer. Um, and hopefully it's a useful 90 minutes to really get to the heart of this policy agenda. So we're joined by uh, Jordan Cummin, who is a health director at the CBI, so bringing a really valuable business pers perspective to this discussion. By Kieran Boyle, who's chief executive of Impact on Urban Health, uh, working in Southwark and Lambeth. We're joined by Sonia Adesara, who is a GP and an activist and uh, an excellent thinker to go alongside it. We're joined by Anna Taylor, Executive Director at the Food Foundation, um, so welcome Anna, and by Dolly Tice, who is uh, a um, population health researcher and uh, many other things besides. We're very excited to have you, Dolly. We're also hugely grateful to those that are partnering with us on this conversation today, so it couldn't happen without them, so sustain the Food Foundation, the Obesity Health Alliance, and the British Heart Foundation. A huge thank you for making this event, this conversation possible. So let me give a little bit of introduction to the discussion we're having today, and the provocation that I wanted to start with, and the thing to put in panelists' minds, is that... IPPR research shows that if we were to bring obesity levels down to, this, to the levels that we saw in the 1980s, then in the current cohort of children, so those people that are children today, that would be worth for them 359 billion pounds to the economy, and it would save 66 billion for the NHS. So huge gains over the course of their lifetime. And of course, as new cohorts of children emerge and, and go through life, then those savings would be exponential. It's, of course, not just an economic question, it's also a human one. Um, we know that obesity is one of the greatest public health threats we face. Um, it causes uh, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, some kinds of cancer. Um, so it's both a human and an economic case. We also know that we're talking at a time of great churn and debate in terms of what the food and obesity policy landscape looks like. We've, I'm sure, all seen the rumors and briefings that uh, the policies that we saw under Boris Johnson in that July 2020 obesity strategy are now under threat. Things like the soft drinks industry levy uh, is, 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 is a policy that's being debated. And we've seen from this morning that there's questions over still what the Labour response would be to that. So an interesting time to have the discussion, a time where things are uncertain, but that there's probably a permeable membrane for new ideas as well. So that's probably enough to start getting the, the thinking going, the, the, uh, the provocation there. Um, why don't I come to each of the panelists for uh, a little bit of their thoughts, their reflections. And Anna, I wonder if we can start with you for your take. Yeah, thanks very much, um, Chris. And great to see you all here. Thanks so much for coming. Um, so I will try and in the first instance, just set out what we mean by the junk food cycle, just so we've got a bit of context for the conversation and really looking forward to having the opportunity to discuss some of the issues with you in the, in the Q&A. Um, so this phrase was sort of first, I suppose, properly coined, though obviously people have been talking about these issues for a number of decades, in the uh, National Food Strategy, which um, was commissioned by the government and published just over a year ago. Um, uh, authored by Henry Dimbleby. Um, and I was um, fortunate to be on his team and really um, helping to, to, to get us into the real specifics of how the food system is incentivized to sell junk food and how we've come to the point over the last 50 plus years to where these foods, which are usually um, 
very calorie dense, they don't necessarily have very many, very many other nutrients, they've typically got a high profile of sugar and fat and salt. How we've come to a point where these foods play such a massively important part in what we eat. And we're now in a situation where they make up between 50 to 60% of the calories we eat are in the form of these foods, which you can classify as, you might not want to call them junk foods, you might call them foods high in fat, sugar, and salt, but they have a classification now in policy terms. And they've kind of taken over our diets and are continuing to take over our diets. So categories of food which you don't think of as being junk food, like breakfast cereals or yogurts, have been gradually absorbed into this category as the ingredients and the nutrient profiles of these foods have shifted over time. Now, now so the question is, sort of, how have we got to this point? Now, I think what we tried to describe in the, in the notion of the junk food cycle is that it's become this really um, negative feedback loop which connects both our appetites and our genetic um, disposition to seeking out energy-dense foods. That's sort of how we're programmed. Um, and a food industry which is entirely now geared up to sell us more and more of these foods, and they've become incredibly good at doing so. And these foods also have something intrinsic in them which mean that we're less good at controlling it. They're less good at controlling our appetite. So we eat more of them than we would of other types of food when we're, when we're hungry. We don't, we don't get satiated as quickly, and so we end up eating more of them. And this link of us then enjoying them, eating more than we otherwise would, and the food industry becoming, you know, that gradually those ingredients have become cheaper and cheaper to produce. They're heavily subsidized. Uh, they're non-perishable, so they have a long shelf life. All of these things which make it much, much easier to make money out of selling them mean that the food industry has become geared to sell these products in vast quantities to us. When you look at advertising, when you look at promotions, when you look at price, they're all skewed in the direction of making these foods easier for us to eat, more appealing, more abundant, more in the places when we're looking for food to eat. So we've got this we're, we're stuck in this cycle. It's like a trap. It's a trap for companies, and it's a trap for us as citizens. And if you know people who are, there are many people across the country who are struggling with their weight, and we shouldn't be surprised with that because we are stuck in this cycle. And so the challenge for us as citizens and for policymakers, political parties, is how to deal with it. What do we do? And we've obviously got some, some nice bits of policy that have been introduced and been incredibly successful. I'm sure others will talk about the sugary drinks tax, which was a great way of trying to, in a small way, disrupt these commercial incentives by, by taxing an ingredient, essentially, in the form of sugar. And we've seen you know, products reformulate and behavior switch, and we're, we're all now drinking a lot less sugar through this category of products. Um, and there have been another, a few other interventions which are on the table currently, uh, not quite clear whether they're going to come through, things like restrictions on advertising, which, again, just put the brakes a little bit on this cycle. They're in and of themselves small interventions, considering the scale of this challenge that we're in, but they're really important for starting to build, put the brakes on it. Um, and, of course, if you're on a very low income, and now we've got a situation where the, the being able to afford to eat is a challenge which millions of families are facing, growing numbers day by day. You are very quickly pushed further into the problem of this junk food cycle because these calories are typically one third of the price of healthier foods. So, you know, you're, it, you're going to be pushed into some of those foods. I mean, this is a very, very simple example here just from the, the local Tesco. This is, so kids' yogurts. This is the cheapest set of kids. They're similar weight, so it's six little portions. Uh, this, this is a pound um, and has uh, a teaspoon of added sugar per portion. Uh, and um, this is the healthiest kids' yogurt. We don't have any natural yogurts for kids. I mean, in small packets like this, geared up for kids. Um, this is the healthiest one with no added sugar. And this is one pound 80. 
one pound twenty if you've got a club card, but nevertheless, still, even if it's only a twenty pence price differential, literally every penny counts at the moment. And so, it would be a very simple decision for a family. So we'll go for those ones, um, and that that plays itself out in multiple categories. Um, the incentives are all skewed in the wrong direction. So, I think I think uh, one point that I wanted to, in terms of where we go next. I think there are very many food, the, the, the mantra that's coming out out of the Conservative Party now and worryingly also from Labour is that, oh, we don't, want to, we don't want to make things harder for businesses. That's the sort of, we don't, you know, whether you're looking, some might be more badging that as nanny state, but one way or another, there's a real reluctance to intervene with businesses. And from my conversations with many businesses, certainly not all, but there is a good number of businesses who I think are ahead of policymakers at the moment in actually knowing that they need to go in a certain direction and need, because of the competitive environment in which they operate, need policies which are creating a level playing field and allowing them to move in that direction. At the moment, policy is in some ways it's a drag on, on a more progressive mm. business position. Um, and I think we've seen that with the recommendation that came from the National Food Strategy that, as a starting point, all of these companies ought to report, produce data on their sales, of healthy versus unhealthy food, and a various set of other metrics, that should be publicly available and reported to government and ultimately parliament on an annual basis so that you can start to see, well, is this going in the right direction or not, and what are the policies we might need to introduce to create the incentives to shift. So I'll stop there because others will talk about other interventions, but um, hopefully that gives us a bit of stuff for the conversation later. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Anna. That's a great introduction to the discussion and debate. Sonia, I wanted to come to you next from the uh, clinical perspective. I've talked a little bit about the NHS and, and the cost there, um, but, but what do you see? Yeah. Thanks for having me. Um, Chris called me a thinker, but I'm less of a thinker on day three of conference. <laughs> <laughs> and also, as you can probably hear, my voice is struggling, so I'm going to try and project, but if you can't, you should be able to hear me with the microphone. Um, so I thought I'd tell you about, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I, um, was, I, I was speaking to one of my patients, so we had some, done some routine blood tests on her, found out that her liver enzymes were not, were, were not quite normal, so I ordered a scan of her liver, um, and it showed signs of liver damage. So she was a lady in her early 30s, um, so I called her in to explain this to her. Um, and essentially, she had um, what we call um, fatty liver. So essentially, because she was overweight, so, you know, fat, fatty deposits in her liver, and it was causing her liver damage. Um, so I explained this to her, and I explained to her that because you're overweight, you know, we're starting already to see the, the impact that it's had on your body. Um, I explained the long-term impact of her being overweight, how it could affect her health. Um, and as you know, being being overweight and being obese, it can it actually affects every organ and every part of your body. It increases your risks of most cancers. It can increase your risk of arthritis. It can increase your risk of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, it increases your risk of being in chronic pain, and it increases your risk of dying at an earlier age. Um, so I explained this all to her, and then she just looked at me and she said, I know. <laughs> She's like, I know this. And she says, I, I look in the mirror. I know I'm overweight. I am trying to be healthier. But she said, do you know what? She said, it's hard. Um, and you know, she was a single mom. She worked quite long hours. She says that a few times a week, yes, she got maybe a takeaway or got some ready meals in. Um, and I just, I felt, you know, I felt so, I felt, I felt awful because I think like, I know that. I know how hard it is in, to, so easy to put on weight. It's so hard to lose weight. Um, and I just think the, this language that we use around obesity and about, around personal choice and it's up to you to lose that weight, despite the fact that we know we live in this obesogenic environment that Anna explained, and I just think it can really make, it makes people feel like personal, that they are failing for being overweight. And I just think that can be, it's deeply damaging and I think we really need to change how we talk about weight and explain why, why it is in our current environment it most most people really really struggle struggle to have a healthy weight and have a healthy diet, um, and then you know sort of the strange thing. Then later on in that day, I had a 
um, and I was speaking to a mother on the phone. She said, look, I'm really concerned about my child. I'm not sure. I think he needs some assessment and some blood tests. Just concerned that he was unwell. I was like, okay, fine, bring him in. Um, and then a main concern was that he was, he looked underweight compared to the other kids. Um, she said people have made comments about it. And I thought, actually, you know what? He looks quite skinny. Let's, let's weigh him. So we weighed him, got the growth charts out, plotted his weight. And he was bang in the middle of what a healthy weight should be. And that really struck me that actually he was a perfect healthy weight. And yet the mum, family members, myself, all thought he was underweight. And it just shows that actually for kids now, kids in this country, being overweight is the norm. And that's really, really, that's shocking. And I think at some point the penny has to drop. Right? The current strategy hasn't worked. Right? And we have kids, we have kids that are growing up overweight and obese. There's long-term health impacts of that, and their lives could potentially be cut short by that. And we are failing this generation by failing to act. Right? And we know that the, the current strategy has failed. Um, and then I think, you know, just lastly, I want to touch upon the things that we've heard this week, what Chris mentioned about. Um, going back on certain policies that were suggested by Boris Johnson because of the cost of living in crisis and because it will affect, because of it, it will affect potentially poor households who are struggling to make ends meet. And I really get frustrated by this argument and it makes me really angry because what I know, because I work in Tottenham um, and what actually the evidence shows that it is, it is poorer families who are more likely actually to be, particularly poorer children who are more likely to be overweight and obese. Um, and and we also know that in this country, if you are from a more deprived background, you are more likely to die, well, you'll be dying at a younger age than someone from a wealthy background, and you're also more likely to get sick. There's about an average of 15 years that you'll be getting sick and Ill, you'll be in ill health compared to someone from a wealthy background. And a large factor, we know that a big contributing factor to that is diet and poor nutrition. Right, so we know that the poorest in our society are the ones who are most likely to be affected by the negative health impacts of being overweight and obese. And then on top of that, as we know, it is more, um, being healthy is actually more expensive. You know, healthier foods are three times the cost of, of poorer foods. I read somewhere that if you're in the very poorest, low, poorest um, the lowest, lowest income, you could be spending up to 75% of your disposable incomes if you were to follow the government's healthy food guidelines. So that choice, that privilege, to be healthy is just not there for many, for many of the poorest people in our society. So if the government wanted to help poorer families, if they wanted to help their health and wanted to prevent them from getting unwell, then they can be implementing policies that make healthier foods cheaper. Um, and they're not doing so. And I think it's a real cop out just to say that we're not gonna do anything. Um, and then finally, you know, Chris is calling me an, an activist doctor. I, I, I learned my lessons actually from a, um, a veteran activist doctor, and I remember when I was a, when I was a junior doctor, we was, I was at his retirement dinner, um, and we were talking about his career and what he'd done, um, and he said to me the biggest, he was a, he was a respiratory doctor, um, and he said to me the biggest scandal of his lifetime was what happened with tobacco, and he said, we saw, we saw what the impact tobacco was having on people, we saw the slow death people were having from COPD, from lung cancer, the respiratory wards were full of it, we knew the information, we knew what was happening, we knew it was a result of tobacco. And for years and years and years, there was obfuscation, there was going around in circles, there was talks about the nanny state, and how many lives were lost. And I just think we are, we're repeating history, right? We know, we know the impact of what obesity has on people's health. We know that it cuts lives short. We know that there are policies that can be implemented that can help prevent that. And I just think it is a, it's, it is a, um, it's a complete, to not implement these policies now, it's, 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 a, it's, it's irresponsible, but I just think it's, it, it's, it's, it's morally corrupt to not do that. Um, so we need to act now. Um, and I would urge both political parties, actually, you know, I've seen some, some statements today by um, Labour, both political parties need to, act, need to know that now and let's not repeat history and allow preventable harm to continue. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you for that call to arms and those really interesting cases that you've seen um, 
in the NHS itself. Jordan, I wanted to come to you for yep. your perspective. Uh, would you like to go next? Yeah, um, so thanks so much for having uh, the CBI today. Uh, historically, we probably wouldn't have joined challenging panels like this, so I'm delighted that we're much more progressive and open <laughs> and uh, happy to be on stages. Um, and so most of you might know us for shouting about the economy in the papers most days, um, but actually coming out of the pandemic, when we were looking you know, at what the economy should look like and feel like if you're operating in it, either from a consumer perspective or an industry perspective in the next 10 years, um, the reason the biggest business body came to the table in the health space is because the push from business themselves, not from us, was that we need a forward-looking agenda on the resilience of the workforce, and it needs to be rooted in individual choices from firms and individuals about health, and it can't just be about managing COVID. Um, and so joining debates like this is really core to that. Uh, and for us, it's about learning as much as we possibly can about the activism that's out there, the shareholder movements, the view from investors, anything that's happening beyond the boardroom that is going to push decision makers to make decisions we are very keen to know about. Um, and so the food debate for us um, is knotty. I won't lie to you. There are lots of businesses out there who uh, have been spending lots and lots of money in recent years trying to comply with legislation that may now be rode back on, depending on what the government does. Um, it's not to say that we're pushing for that legislation to either be there or not be there, but what we do want to kind of get across from lots of these debates at the moment is that we are facing a gigantic health challenge even beyond obesity, uh, and micro-regulating sometimes our way out of this is going to be really, really tough. If we think about what Sajid Javid did on the mental health strategy, which we were really delighted to be involved with before he left office, it was a cross-departmental push. It was all about prevention. It was a multi-year strategy, and it brought in lots of different things that fed into mental health challenges. And I think um, in our discussions with the civil service and business up and down the country, uh, we definitely want to get to a place where we're pushing business sufficiently, but the government infrastructure is thinking about cross cross-departmental, multi-year, long-term strategies and not necessarily micro-regulating our way out of everything. But in terms of, I guess, how business is approaching this discussion, uh, something rare happened during the pandemic. Uh, trust in business went up, and believe me, I've been doing this long enough to know that that doesn't happen lightly. Um, and it happened because the line between decisions employers made and people's individual health was shortened for the first time for many people ever. Uh, and so what we have coming out of the pandemic, we hope, or the immediacy of it, is a real window uh, for you to be landing some kind of progressive, forward-looking change. And you will get a reception from industry, pockets of industry that may never have given you a reception before, maybe for the first time ever. And so the point I'm trying to make there is that these debates are coming at the right time. They are unfortunately also coming at a time where the cost of doing business could genuinely never be higher. I mean, we are talking about people's energy bills going up sometimes five to 600% to the point where sometimes the cost of running a business at the moment is bigger than the profit you make. And so when we talk about how difficult it is to do business, when we talk about the government saying we don't want to add burden onto industry, it's not fluff. You know, it, it is rooted in statistics. Um, that's not to say that I'm joining this panel to say that businesses is fantastic and they've never done anything wrong. Um, but what we are saying, I guess, going forward is we agree with you on the push for making people healthier. You know, we lose about 130 million working days a year, as an example, costs about 200 billion quid. It's a lot, a lot of money, uh, not just in obesity, in the multitude of other health conditions we have. And so business definitely wants to be in the discussion. They may disagree with you sometimes, the pace at which they can move. If the money isn't there, sometimes the money just isn't there to make reformulation happen. And lots of firms have done stuff in recent years, and we should definitely herald them for moving. Um, I guess my last point um, is that regulation in this country, doesn't matter what sector it's in, is hard to do. Quite a lot of the time, it's mainly stick and no carrot, whereas some of the best regulation we have is regulation for improvement and innovation as well as compliance. Um, and I think just sometimes we jump to there's a big intractable challenge. Uh, we don't necessarily have an easy way to solve it. Um, business has got to pay for it. Uh, government hasn't got the right answers. Business has got to be the answer. Uh, and sometimes business will be the answer, but they won't necessarily be able to move at the pace that you need them to move. Um, and so I guess our plea, and what I think would be good to get into later from our perspective, um, is where firms can't, especially at the small and medium-sized level, where firms can't go as fast as they possibly can. Bear in mind the supermarkets have very long, complex supply chains with people who are much smaller than Tesco and Sainsbury's and whoever else. Um, 
how can we get them around the table? It doesn't have to be this kind of big debate. We shuffle off into our corners. We all come up with the answers. And then suddenly, a few years down the line, a new government means that they're rowing back. Um, I think how we get the most amount of people around the table to move forward has got to be the way we go now. And I, and I would just say that the window of kind of getting business to listen, even to things that you might think they don't like, uh, I guess is open. Brilliant. Thank you for those uh, hugely thoughtful remarks, Jordan. Um, and I strongly agree. I think the thing that excites me about this panel is there's, there's business representatives, civil society, um, the NHS, and, and researchers. It's that kind of conversation that feels to me important. And speaking of researchers, Dolly, why don't we bring you in to, to hear your thoughts and, and what you've been um, working on on this theme? Yes, thank you very much. Um, and great to see lots of familiar faces here. Um, so we're talking about the junk food cycle, um, but I want to talk about a different cycle, the junk policy cycle, um, or better known as the nightmare policy cycle, um, which is just the ob obesity strategy um, repetition is probably one of the, the best case um, examples of this happening in terms of repeated government policies. So to give you an idea of the history um, in England alone, since 1992, there have been 689 obesity policies introduced, and yet no reduction in the obesity prevalence or related health inequalities. Uh, so almost 700 individual policies proposed. And many of these over those 30 years are repeated uh, policy ideas, so the same policies proposed again and again in that time. And to give you a little example of recent years, uh, under a conservative government, um, coalition and conservative government since 2010, there have been four major obesity strategies. And within those have contained almost exactly the same policies proposed again and again. Um, to give you some reasons why this uh, nightmare policy cycle continues, um, very few of the policies get implemented, and that's for all sorts of reasons, um, but they're often proposed in a way that's unlikely to lead to their implementation. So there's sort of seven criteria for a policy um, to increase a policy's chance of getting implemented, and it sounds very you know, formal and, and um, scientific, and in fact, it's incredibly basic things like a time frame, a cost, uh, a person or, or organization or, or government department that's responsible. So these seven pieces of information that are in likely to increase the chances of a policy getting implemented, in I can't tell you how few policies fulfill that criteria, but the largest proportion of all of those 689 policies, the largest proportion did not contain a single piece of information that would increase its chance of being implemented versus just 8% of policies having all seven pieces of information. So policies are very light, unlikely to be actioned even when they're proposed. So that's one reason why you get this repetition. Uh, another reason is that you get new governments coming in and they want to be different. So you can have a government like uh, Boris Johnson did when he came in. There were three strategies already proposed under a conservative government. So one would uh, assume that they uh, aligned with his views. Um, and they contained exactly the same policy ideas pretty much. Um, and then he came in and said, I'm going to introduce a new one um, for all sorts of reasons. So there's a desire to be different. There's also a fundamental misunderstanding often with the most effective and equitable way to actually tackle the issue. Um, so we often focus on policies or governments often focus on policies that are very high agency for the individual. So you really need to use a lot of personal resource and engagement to convert that policy into any meaningful long-term behavior change rather than policies that look at shaping the environment and structures around us to just make it easier to live a healthier life. So a lot of the policies are ineffective and inequitable, which even when implementing means that you're not actually going to see the change that we so desperately need. Um, and that misunderstanding of how policies work, we're seeing in the debate today when I switched on the news and saw Wes Streeting talking about the soft drinks industry levy, and I was like, oh, gosh, can't even get my head around another politician talking about a policy uh, in a way that it doesn't work. So he was saying he's not going to introduce taxes of that kind because they target people at a time where the cost of living crisis is high. The soft drinks industry levy is not designed to target people. It targets companies, and it targets companies in a way that if they don't, uh, if they reformulate their products or have products that are under a certain threshold of sugar amount, they don't pay anything. 
So to even put out the idea that these kind of policies target individuals when they are not designed to do that is either misinformation or worse disinformation. Um, and also on top of that, on the cost of living crisis, this SDIL, uh, the revenue that's raised from it goes to actually funding programs <laughs> for low-income families. So it is sort of the double whammy of either misinformation or disinformation. And it's a kind of interesting question of what's worse, uh, a politician who is the shadow health secretary who doesn't understand how one of the most important leading policies in this, um, in this area works, or that he knows how it works, but his desire to be politically popular is so strong that he's actually using that disinformation to win over political popularity. I don't know which one's worse, but <laughs> uh, or it could be a combination of both, which would uh, be, be even worse than that. So... There is also this massive desire about political popularity, and something in that is around the framing of these policies, the, the overcoming the kind of nanny state accusations and the idea that when you intervene in food, it's about telling people what uh, they should and shouldn't eat, when actually the reality of a, of a lot of these policies is not telling anyone, it's increasing options for people and enhancing the kind of availability and access, particularly for low-income families. So this desire to be politically popular, I sort of want to pose the question back to you maybe for the discussion, is how, maybe here at the Labour Party conference, but obviously interested in this from all political parties, how can we reframe this entire agenda so that it aligns better with political ideologies, with political parties' priorities, and to align the priorities that they already say they have. When we talk about the cost of living, it should, you know, the automatic uh, uh, reaction when it comes to these sorts of policies, if they are understood in the way that they actually work, should be going, yes, the SDIL is critical for the cost of living. Not only is it in increasing choices, healthy choices for everyone, but it's also funding programs um, for low-income families, or whether it's about enhancing economic productivity, and you absolutely need a healthy society as the bedrock of a thriving economy and a productive society. How can we talk about this debate in a way that isn't about seen as taking away choices, is seen as nanny statism, and instead enhancing options, creating freedom, uh, for people and increasing the options that are available, particularly for the lowest income. So uh, not only do I sort of want to call to arms to the government to, to, to break the nightmare policy cycle, but how do we reframe the debate so that it better aligns with our political leaders? Brilliant. Thanks so much, Dolly. And I'm sure there are many in this room that will empathize with that policy nightmare and have been mm -hmm. working on these issues for 10, 10, 15 years uh, in, in some kind of cycle. Um, we've talked. Uh, a bit about the macro and the national, Kieran. Um, you obviously see from your perspective how this works in places and the, the neighbourhoods mm. people live. Um, what's your perspective? Thank you. Um, hello. Um, it's a real pleasure to be with you this morning. The advantage of going last is you get to reiterate kind of the really <laughs> important point uh, that you've heard. So let, so let me give three uh, that I've heard consistent from, from people. We need both political parties to act on that. Uh, uh, that's, uh, that's absolutely necessary. It's Wes. Wes! Wes, come back! We, <laughs> Wes, we need to have a conversation. Okay, well, I hope. Well, crashing sense of metaphor uh, right, right there. Uh, okay, well, we need, we need both political parties to act and help from her in the room. Uh, second, it very clearly, it costs us more not to act than to act. We just need to be really clear about that. And third, but I think most importantly, and Sonia, you made this point, this is ultimately, it's a question about fairness. And that for me is really a question about what sort of country do we want to be and do we want to be for the long term as well. And I think we just need to keep all of that in mind, it's kind of the context uh, uh, for, 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 for the discussion that we're, uh, we're going to have to today. Um, perhaps because it was raining on the way here, I kind of just felt very gloomy. Uh, uh, and... Uh, and what I want to do is actually kind of push us beyond the gloom to say that what's most important as we think about breaking the junk food cycle is we can. In fact, we know how to do it. There are lots of solutions, solutions out there. We need to be really, really focused in policy terms uh, on, uh, on, on what those are. Um, so I'm going to hit on two I's because this is an IPPR 
panel, and I, I, I represent impact on urban health. And my two eyes are going to be about investors, going to be about innovation. I just want to talk about some stuff that's just happening around us right now, which are really causes uh, for, for optimism. So let's talk about investors. Uh, and I'm going to talk about really big investors, so pension funds, long-term investors, like that. They're really focused uh, on, on this issue of how do you create healthier food environments. The reason that they're focused on it is that they recognise that obesity is a huge problem for UK PLC. We need a healthier workforce. It costs the NHS a lot of money. Uh, so they want to do something about, about that. Um, investors are starting to think a little bit more seriously about climate. And now they're starting to think about health in the same way. And in the same way that if you're thinking about climate, you might look at oil and gas investments as stranded assets. Like, why would you invest in those things? Not consistent with, with the future that we need. Well, they're looking at sugar in exactly the same way and saying, well, that's not really consistent with investing in really, really sugary foods. So they're working with uh, companies like Tesco and companies like Unilever, um, these really big investors, to talk to them about being much more transparent about the food that they're selling and pushing them to commit to selling healthier products, a greater share of healthier products, and meaningfully so. So Tesco this year committed that by 2026, two thirds of its products sold would be healthier products. One in every five pounds that we spend on food as a country is spent in Tesco's. So like, this stuff really, really matters. So even if we're not seeing government in the UK proceed as fast as we would like, big actors are like Tesco's and Unilever are really kind of moving, uh, moving, moving on this. Secondly, it's, we, it's important to talk about the role uh, of regulation, but let's also talk, talk about the role of innovation. Jordan, I'm really glad that you brought that up because, in fact, food has been reformulated all the time. That's what the food uh, industry does. We just need to change the incentives, as, uh, as, as, Anna, as Anna says. And there are loads of entrepreneurs out there who are trying to do different things to make food that is healthy and also works for people who have less money to spend on food. We've actually uh, invested ourselves in a fund that has backed some of the entrepreneurs out there. Um, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the companies that invested in is called Urban Legend. They've worked out how to make a donut that's really tasty but has 50% uh, less uh, uh, fat and sugars in it. And there's loads of entrepreneurs out there like that. And I think there's a role for policy to support that sort of innovation too. So it's partly about regulation, about trying to kind of take stuff out, but also how do we back those innovators who are trying to come up with, with, with new things too. Um, the common factor I think that I would like to put out across all of those is that what we need for that is a level playing field. We need to have a level playing field to, to support those companies that are trying to do the right thing. And look, that's popular with the general public. They support a level playing field. It's certainly popular with the National Health Service. Mm -hmm. They need that level playing field. And it's popular with businesses that are trying to do the right thing. They just don't want to be um, uh, harmed for trying to, do, trying to do the right thing. So how would I sum up? Um, uh, I would say that regulation in this space, greater work on uh, reformulation, uh, greater support for innovation, it's good for business. It's good for people. It's good for our national economy. But what we can't do is try and imagine away this issue around obesity, which is, I, I fear, where a lot of political parties are at the moment. We do need to meet it head on, but we know what to do to meet it head on. So it's about political will in this space. And so I like Dolly's idea of kind of what questions do we want to put into uh, uh, for the debate. And actually, the question I'd like to put in is how do we ensure that there's a sufficient urgency um, uh, in the political debate around this challenge, because it is one of the greatest challenges I think we're facing as a country, but the solutions certainly aren't beyond us. Brilliant. Thanks very much. I think that's a really empowering message to end the opening remarks on. So thank you, Kieran. Um, so I'll just take us through one question before we come to Q&A. So uh, if, you're, if you're formulating questions, we'll, we'll come to them in a second, but do, do keep thinking of them. Um, and I suppose it's a question of where you think the aspirational uh, vision is. What do you think that includes? Um, where can, we're at Labour Party conference, where can Labour look for um, bold policies should they go in that direction? 
And I suppose I'm always struck by two comparisons. So um, by tobacco, quite a classic comparison. We've seen lots of policy on tobacco over the last, say, 70, 80 years. We've seen good progress. We have the government now committing to things like uh, a smoke-free future uh, and the first smoke-free generation. More work to do to get there, but a very different situation to obesity where we've seen the reverse. We've seen a, an incredibly quick uptick in, in childhood and adult obesity rates since the 1980s. And the other is um, the environment and pollution, again, mm -hmm. an area where there's been lots of, um, lots of government policy and there's still more work to do, but it's been a slightly different and more interventionist mm -hmm. approach. Um, I'm interested in the dynamics of that, not just because of the progress, but also thinking about, uh, I suppose, what the dynamics are of, um, we know that Labour are talking a lot about partnership and their preferred approach for partnership and to what extent those comparisons lead into that, but also that in the case of both tobacco and, uh, and, and the environment, if we think about the polluters, there's been some challenges for, for how that's been framed and, uh, and some businesses have fallen on the wrong side of, of, of that debate. Um, by not acting quickly enough. So I'd be interested from that perspective, what do the panelists think of next steps, where we can learn lessons, and also where there are things that, you know, from a business perspective, um, might be better avoided from, from, from partnership working. And Jordan, I wonder if it's worth coming to you first on, on those comparisons. Yeah, so I think um, I really like the climate analogy. We talk about it a lot in the CBI. The thing about climate was seven, eight, nine years ago, after we'd spent decades quibbling about how you measure it, when it finally got to the point where government turned around and said, right, we're going to start taking it seriously, um, it was really only until, as Kieran says, you know, the investor community started taking it seriously that you see kind of large swathes of action. One of the other things that was kind of really formative um, was business turning around and saying, we kind of need stability. So we get that things will have to change. We get that research gets updated. We understand that clinical priorities shift. We understand that there's a new government every three or four years or two, depending on what the cycle looks like. Um, but what we need is stability of regulation. So if you're going to regulate us, we need to know if it's five, 10, 15 years. If we're going to have to change again, we can't do it overnight, especially if our margins are narrow. So um, what we learned from the climate debate is that long-term stability of regulation is, is kind of number one. And number two, around Kieran's point uh, on innovation, and this is the partnership working element, I used to do loads of work with um, Sadiq Khan in London, the Skills Challenge Fund was a great example of, uh, where we turned around and said we had a really big issue, we really need the private sector to step up. Um, the private sector is very disparate, getting them to do anything in one direction can be very difficult, especially if they're from different sectors at any one time. Um, but giving them a framework within which you could say, go away and play, come up with solutions, but this is the parameter, uh, is a really fantastic starting block, uh, because as good as regulation is, you will far exceed uh, what you can achieve through regulation, through innovation among the private sector. And without it, we wouldn't be where we are today with 1.5 degrees, working towards net zero in 2030. And to get there, we basically needed businesses to go away and say, look, this is the frame. We've got some money to do something about it. Let's prove how we can do it. Um, and so those two points, I think, about regulatory stability and being honest about what that window looks like, and then kind of setting them a challenge. Here's your framework. Go away and so show us how you would do it. Um, you'll get more success out of the innovation point than you ever would trying to regulate your way out of this. Really interesting. Thanks very much, Jordan. Kieran, what about you? What do you think? Vision. Um, we should be talking UK growth and we should be talking UK productivity because uh, that's really what this sits within. So, uh, so UK, UK growth. Let's pick up on the, on the innovation point. Why isn't the UK, with everything that it has in its... Uh, it's Arsenal, an absolute world leader in how you create healthy food that works for the mass market. Um, uh, we certainly have the companies to do it. We know how to do it. Uh, we have the research that tells us where we should be putting, uh, putting our efforts. We even have the uh, investment infrastructure that will really support that. So there are industries here. It's not about kind of an anti competitive or, 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 or anti-industry anti position. But it's also about UK productivity, and it's absolutely vital that we get into this. Sarah, uh, what is it, half a million people post-pandemic that have been lost from the UK workforce? Um, they've been lost from the UK workforce because they're not well enough to work. And the overwhelming reason why people aren't well enough to work is due to, is due to the issue of obesity and the health issues that that flow from that. 
we can't begin to tackle our productivity challenges if we aren't really recognizing what sits behind them. And poor health uh, is, 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 a huge, is a huge one of, of those. So, so I guess like the vision is to say, this is about obesity, and we've got to do important things around it, but we need to understand why it's so important from other angles, which are about UK growth and UK productivity. Yeah, really interesting. I think it's striking that we've seen this conference be defined by an industrial strategy for uh, the environment. Um, we can think about the headline commitments that the leader of the Labour Party has made on that. But what's the equivalent for, for health? Yeah. Um, I think that's a fascinating comparison to make. Sonia, where would you go? Yeah, I think it, there are similarities with, um, with, 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 with climate and the environment. Um, but I think, I think there's differences as well. So I think, I guess, you know, the shift, well, we knew about the science about climate change for a very long, very long time. Um, and I think most of us realise that we can't sort of recycle our way out of this. But I think the shift that we saw in, 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 pol in government policy and, and, and business policy came from the public. So it was a public understanding that actually, yes, we can do our bit, but actually we're not going to solve this crisis and it's up to you to sort of to, to take action. Um, but I don't think we have quite have that understanding with obesity. And we still, I think for most of the public, it, most of the public, their, their, their belief is that it, this is my personal problem. Um, and there's not enough understanding that actually we live in a obesogenic environment and that can be changed. So I think actually it's, there is, a, there, is a, there is more to be had about making the public understand that actually there is, there is really, we can be changing our environment and we can be making our country better, not just with food, but with, like, with um, how our cities are planned, how we get about, how we can make active transport the norm. There is so much that can be done to make it, make it, make it the norm to be easy and healthy. It, make, make it the norm, make it easy to be healthy in this country and it would make this country a better place to live and a better place to grow up um, so that's the shift that I think I think it's sh shifting the public's perception about about the changes that we can have in this country to make to make this to make it easier I think that's fascinating and there's really fascinating frameworks Institute research that shows one that when the public talk uh, or, or have conversations around obesity yes individual responsibility overwhelmingly the first frame that comes to mind but there are ways to communicate around obesity mm. that don't activate that frame, that activate actually the kind of more structural understanding that I think lots of us are talking about. Um, so I think it's a really salient point to raise. Um, Anna, what about you thinking about what we can learn, where we can be aspirational? Um, what do you think? So I'd like to uh, make two points building on both um, Jordan and Sonia. So um, Jordan, you set out the sort of argument for why um, setting the broad parameters of what you want businesses to do in sort of outcome terms is good for st stimulating innovation and so forth. I might not have said it exactly the way you would, but broadly along those lines. And um, I think that's a crucial part of what we need to do next. I think we need to be setting out what our expectations are of the food system. We probably need to be setting in legislation a target for reducing diet-related disease, which can be not something f just for industry, but for government and all the other sort of constellation of actors. And, um, and setting out where, where we need the direction of travel to go in things like these metrics, which Kieran talked about, where companies are setting sort of sales-based targets of shifting from unhealthy to healthy foods, for example. And I think that's a really... Uh, what we can't do, I think what, what history has shown through some of the stuff which Dolly has talked about, is that um, A, flip-flopping all the time from one policy to another, which is what we're seeing at the moment, which is, creates all of this uncertainty, which makes it very difficult for businesses to do anything useful, but also doing these measures in a voluntary capacity rather than one which actually requires everybody to act and creates the level playing field which was talked about, um, I think that's, so, so how do we set mandatory, a set, of, a set of legislative framework which lays out the direction of travel that we want to go, to go in and um, requires businesses to do, contribute their part to those outcomes? That's the first point. And then second, on, on Sonia's point, I think you've touched on something really important, is that, that, that actually in reality, um, <coughs> Many of the decisions about once we've got the confines of our sort of finances, 
worked out, what those decisions about what we eat are often very socially driven. They're like, you know, what am I going to enjoy to eat with my kids? What, what will allow me to bond with my teenager? What, are they, what do they like? What, what means we're going to have a nice conversation over dinner or whatever? Creating that sort of, it's, it's about how we build our relationships with, e with each other. And I think if we can set out a vision which is about great food, which is a sort of under, you know, you can see food as a way into a whole raft of policy areas, whether it's about protecting nature or whether it's about um, uh, enjoying food in good company with our friends and cooking for one another. There's, there's ways into all kinds of aspects of building a better society if we're able to create a really positive vision for how great food can be, be good for all of us. And I think we're, we're at the moment, you know, we've, we've, we've created the burning platform, if you like. I don't think we've created the vision in quite the way that we need to about what good, what really good looks like. Um, and I think that's on us as much as everyone else to, 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 to have that vision clarified in our minds because at the moment it, it's in danger of being the sort of people waving at you saying, stop eating that mm. junk food, you know mm. what I mean? <laughs> yeah, really interesting. So a vision of it where it could be more than eat the greens or you don't get any pudding. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, Dolly, what do you think? Um, I mean, very much an agreement, and I sort of feel like I'll uh, doing a, summering, a summary of, of what's been said. Um, it feels like this agenda, if you break down the framing barriers, it's, it's got a sort of triple threat um, of a triple negative framing burden with this whole agenda. You've got the nanny state, uh, government intervention, government role burden to overcome. You've got the individual versus the structural determinants uh, understanding to overcome the sort of how do we move away from blaming individuals and understanding the role that structural environmental determinants play in health, which you don't have when it comes to tobacco and climate change now. If you ask anyone about, you know, how do you tackle those issues, they don't default to just need to educate people more about smoking or educate people more about climate change. Um, but we are very much stuck in that frame when it comes to uh, this agenda. Um, and finally, the health burden, uh, which the, the kind of rebranding exercise that needs to occur with making health aspirational and healthy food not to be the default to think of a salad or a single piece of fruit is so difficult. And there's a brilliant charity which uh, Henry Dimbleby co-founded called Chefs in Schools that brings brilliant good food to uh, schools around the UK. And I have learned more uh, through my interactions with chefs and schools about this particular um, problem, this rebranding exercise when it comes to healthy food through chefs and schools than, than anywhere else. Healthy, the notion of healthy food is so rejected by so many groups because it, it just doesn't have an aspirational appealing brand. That's largely because you don't see um, nutritious food advertised in the same way and marketed in the same way as other types of food. And the kind of branding associations that have been built up over decades by companies with very particular types of food, which are mostly ultra processed and most, mostly unhealthy, um, so confectionery, biscuits, crisps, the, the, the language that companies use around the kind, these kind of foods um, makes healthy food very unappealing <laughs> and unaspirational. So whether it's the notion of treat, um, and when you think of a treat, no one tends to default to thinking of nutritious food as a treat. So even when you've got options, when you've got interventions that are presenting options, nutritious alternatives, and they can be the same price or they could even be a lower price, that's still not enough often to overcome the kind of, well, if I'm going to have, I can hear people talking to me all the time about the calories on menus, for example, and they go, well, you know, if a salad's basically the same as, you know, a burger, 500 calories, it's not about the nutrition. They'll literally go, well, I may as well, if I'm going to spend my calories, I'm going to go for the, the treat one that I really want. And that's because that association has been built up. So it's incredibly challenging overcoming the kind of state role issue, which again has a, has a massive problem when it comes to the political communication around this, with the understanding of what actually determines people's health and, and the kind of individual rooted lens through which we, we still talk about this. And then the aspiring, appealing nature of nutritious food just not being there. And we need a whole, we need business to kind of help 
um, use their amazing talents when it comes to marketing and, and promoting food um, for, for the nutritious food uh, rather than the unhealthy stuff. So in, until we overcome those three framing barriers, we're very unlikely to see the kind of change we need. Great, thank you, Dolly. I'm gonna to come to the audience now for questions. I can see some hands popping up already. Uh, so I'll take them in rounds of three and then panelists can come back on, on what they like. So we'll go this half of the room first. So I've got one, two, and then one at the back. Thank you very much. Very, very interesting. My name's Paddy Randall. I've been working for about 40 years to control the, uh, or to bring in controls on the baby food industry, which includes the largest ultra-processing food company, Nestle, and others. And so I deal a lot with global trading standards as well. And I think none of you have mentioned that about how the rules that are set at global trading level really influence exactly mm. what, what we're eating. And most of these huge corporations that, you're, that we're dealing with, that's where they play, and that's where you need to go in order to stop them actually uh, doing all the things that, that we're talking about. My, my areas, early years, infant feeding, breastfeeding, exactly, Dolly, so thank you very much for the way that whole issue about controlling marketing is phrased as a nanny state horrible thing and it's the complete opposite of it these these products are completely outsourcing everything that's that's healthy i mean these products stay on the shelf for two years they have to be in order to to be globally traded yeah. don't forget that so it's not your nice little companies around the corner it's the huge guys that are marketing it from all over the world and if we forget that we're missing a huge trick and so please when you say bringing in partnerships or whatever i totally understand i totally get that but the partnership approach since 2000 that came in with bill gates and all the other stuff has really been damaging and I've sat for 14 years on a European Commission platform for action on diet and physical activity. You got nowhere with these companies. They are not interested mm. in, in health. They don't even know what that is really. So please, yeah, they can come up with some good ideas, but don't partner them when you come to do your governance and your policy. Keep them out of that arena. That is not, they are not, human in the way that you or I are. They are actually there for a very specific purpose. So, sorry, I'll stop. <laughs> Great. So uh, an, a, a, a question for us to come to you on, on, on global training and standards and some conversation we can have on partnership. I think we had another question here. Hello. Is this working? Yes. Mm -hmm. My name's oh. Frida Schicker. I have no professional involvement in, uh, in food but I'm an addict of the food program, so I've been following many things. But one thing I have been, has been, I mean, was in education, and I think it's significant there's going to be an emergency resolution today, um, a motion put to conference about um, universal free school meals. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think we need to be thinking, if we're thinking about childhood obesity, about how the education system can make some interventions. Um, Jamie Oliver managed to divert us a bit from rubbish food in schools, and I think there's a lot of ongoing interest in hanging on in there. And it's a popular and populist, uh, as we know, uh, a popular and populist and fairly simple to understand strategy. And you have people like Sadiq Khan who grew up on yep. free school meals, knowing all the downfalls of it, but also the benefits. So I, I, one's interested in those, you know, it's not gonna solve the, the issues that you have um, been discussing in terms of broad, but it should be part of any strategy. And, um, I just, it's, it's what's, I suppose what for me is significant, it addresses this thing of, um, this is a positive. It's not, it's not sort of haranguing anyone. And 
if one can ensure that the food they get in their free school meals is <laughs> changes some perceptions about eating healthy. And I suppose the other thing is quite interesting in Liverpool, there's going to be they could take in over school um, a school kitchen next in the next two weeks uh, at five o'clock to offer um, free meals to families. Yep. Uh, of the children going to school. So I think if you're looking at trying to grab ordinary people's attention, it's those sort of initiatives and then getting them talking, of course, when involving kids, instead of d cooking being, what was it called for my son? Uh, food, food technology. It yep. could be cooking for when you go home, because I was expecting a nice meal when he went and took up that, but no <laughs> <Yeah>. way. <laughs> Just told me off about the state of my fridge. But yeah. yeah, so a really interesting question there on um, free school meals, the role of education, cooking, things we find fascinating. I think there was one at the back. I can see that hand there. It might be for the next round. Hi, thank you very much. Really interesting stuff, as everybody else has said. Um, I think, having been in health since Kingdom Come, we need to put our money where our mouth is for health. Um, I, I've seen us, us as health visiting school nursing out in the community. We're working in communities where the poorest people have really poor access to shops um, and can't afford. Tesco's I see now have got huge, great shelves for people who can bulk buy which is wonderful if you rock up in your Range Rover and you've got a mansion to stock all these cheap loo rolls and so forth and food. Um, for me, I think that's really iniquitous that that's where their focus lies. Um, but what I loved when I worked in Warwickshire some time ago was that we had um, a, a, an agreement with the local allotments and there were veg bags that were available for people to buy. And, and a part of being on a really tight budget is about good planning. And if they knew they'd got veg bags, um, for their family for seven pounds a week, which is what it was at that time. That was really helpful. And it meant they didn't have to go anywhere and that endless cycle of being on a low income and how am I going to get to the shops? And the shopkeepers are really clever at working out what a bus fare is and if it's worth them going to supermarkets and the prices. And obviously, local shops can't afford to have fresh food, fresh vegetables. The other thing is, it was really interesting you brought up about the yogurts. My friend ran a business with... Um, with yogurts that were unsweetened, totally unsweetened, and no sweeteners added. And they did actually at one point sell them to Tesco's, um, but ultimately went bankrupt. And for me, I think the sweetener thing, I'm really worried about sugar-free. I think it's misleading. I'm a bun muncher. I put my hand up, a lovely buns, mm, marvelous. But the thing mm -hmm. is, I found her yogurts disgusting because I'm so used to that sweetness. Yeah. And the sweetener that added now, it's almost sweeter than sugar. And I think that's totally the wrong way because we're bringing people up with the taste. If it's not sweet, it's not good. Well, unless it's got alcohol in it. But that's a by the by. We've got alcohol pops to cover that one. Um, but as health people, we have allowed um, the vending machines in our hospitals, in our schools. What was that about? I mean, really? Selling Coke to, to kids in schools and then complaining because their moods go up and down. I mean, it's a bit of a duh moment, isn't it? Yeah. So it's, it's just about cooperative working in terms of access to foods, which I thought was really good. I know it can't be done across the country, but there's no reason why businesses couldn't look at working with health people to distribute good food. There's no reason why that couldn't happen. I can't see why it shouldn't. But it's also about being responsible as providers. How can we possibly blame those dreadful parents who are pushing burgers through the school gates when Jamie Oliver was preparing delicious food inside? I'd love to have shunted my kids in that school, get them a good meal. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, when we're reinforcing that you can sell Coke and you can sell chocolate bars and whatnot in school, we can't then blame the parents for, for not... Um, for not following suit. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting um, point of what's the health sector's role and uh, what, are the, what are the dynamics when, when things change and, and where the blame lies. Um, I'll come to the panelists. I'm keen to, I know there's, there's hands still up, so um, to get another round in, so I might have to ask us to be relatively punchy from this point. Um, but Jordan, there was a, a relatively direct one there, so why don't I uh, come to you first and we'll go back down the line. Uh, so I think the thing that strings all of those together is leadership. And I've sat on panels with Kieran before where we talk about the data that's missing is 
uh, the role of individual leaders. So we haven't spoken about the family unit today, another big element that we could have got into. I completely agree with supranational actors from the lady at the front. Um, I think, again, if you want to show leadership, this is where your domestic politicians, you're never going to get anywhere if you go there, nothing happens, and you continue doing that years and years. So uh, you probably need domestic leaders to start standing up at those supranational levels. And actually, we've got a big ally in Chris Whitty who loves doing that. So um, we should be rolling him out more actively, probably, to take on that leadership role. Again, leadership, I've been a governor for years and sitting on committee finance chair meetings, uh, procuring food for the canteen is a really tough conversation to have at times if you're also looking at cutting teaching assistance over here in exactly the same conversation. So uh, this is quite knotty, but I completely agree. And to the lady's point at the back, um, you'll find a million fantastic micro examples of individual baristas or individual corner shops or small uh, boutique health food stores doing stuff with their local trust or their local hospital or um, something that happens at local level. For the structural change that we're talking about, getting that to happen in every region, every single part of the day is going to be much, much harder. Uh, and so what we've been really bad at, I think, and I've seen it in the first year of doing this job, is telling the story that's happening at micro level to say that it's physically possible to do some of this stuff. We've now got 42 ICSs across the country. This gives us a fantastic structure to start using some of the levers that government has put in there. Um, but we haven't been telling the story about the fact that it's possible down here so that you can amplify at the top. Um, so I think the thing that links those together is individual leadership, whether it's the family home, whether it's a teacher, whether it's our own politicians to be standing up at supranational level. Um, and I think we just need, need to probably be a bit braver about it. Yeah, really good points. Leadership and bravery I've taken down. Um, Kieran, what do you think? Yeah, let, yes, just yes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but let me go from the micro to uh, uh, to uh, to the macro and actually pick up on two things. I'm so glad that we started speaking about the role of communities and the role of community assets as well um, uh, as part of how we tackle the junk food cycle. I think it's too easy to only think that this is going to be about the big international uh, actors and, and regulation. Uh, uh, as well. And there's loads, there's loads that is practically happening uh, uh, across, across the country. We ourselves, uh, as a philanthropy, have funded a local food pantry, which is about trying to bring a bit more dignity to people going to who have to use food banks about getting more choice about what they can get from a, a, a food bank. And there are loads of these about that we need to be telling the stories better. I was so pleased to hear universal free school meals being mentioned as well. Mm. Absolutely vital. This is part of the answer. Universal free school meals um, uh, make sense, they're good for health, and they bring economic value. Um, uh, what we need to ensure is that kind of the standards that exist on paper also exist on the plate mm. as well. And perhaps Anna might be able to say uh, a little bit more, uh, a little bit more about that. But so, so, so we need to do these things. But what they really tie into is how do we build much more of a culture of health and of promoting health? Two things we need to think about there. Firstly, we tend to think about health as about health care. And healthcare is absolutely vital, but we need to broaden the debate here. Mm. You know, about 70% of what is driving ill health has nothing to do, really, with our National Health Service. It's to do with those conditions that we grow up in, that we live in, that we work. And we just need to be clear about that policy needs to, to recognise that. And then, just to pick up on the point about community assets, we need to make this aspirational, as Dolly is saying. This isn't about being done to, it's about helping people and working with uh, making food environments easier for, for people uh, to, to be healthy as well. We need to get these important framing things right, otherwise we're going to be trapped in this cycle that we're currently in. Yeah, I think really compelling points. Um, one thing that always strikes me is the Japan story. Japan is now renowned for its health, but in the 1960s was the least long-lived G7 nation. Nutrition, universal school meals, absolute pillars of their transformation, which is, I think, a fascinating case. Sonia, what do you think? Yeah, really, really thank you for your question and what, what you said about, about um, formula feeding. It's really interesting. I very, very frequently I'm um, telling mums to not follow the guidance on formula, formula packaging um, for babies because if, you, if they follow the guidance, often they're, over, they're overfeeding their babies um, and they will, the babies, after a while the baby's stomach stretch um, and, then they get, and then they need more of that formula milk. So I'm often saying, don't follow that follow guidance because you're going to overfeed your baby. Um, and obviously, you know, industry know that. Um, so I think we need to be calling out industry. You know, this 
historically we know that formula milk, despite it being, you know, we know it's, it's not as good as breast milk, we know that it's, it's got higher calories and it's more dense, we know that it was pushed on mothers and mothers were told that it was better than breast milk. And again, you know, that's quite immoral that that was done. Um, so I think industry does need to be called out when it's done things that were, that were, that was wrong. Um, and then baby food as well, you know, it's got lots of sugar, try it, try how sweet it tastes. And, you, and, and, and the lady at the back was talking about how we're just so used now to, 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 to sweet food. And that's done from quite a young age that, that your palate is getting used to very, very sweet food. And it takes quite a long time to, to have to wean yourself off that. Um, so yes, I think we need to be having conversations with industry. And actually, from a very, very young age, so what they're doing to our palate and to our and to, and to bodies is really wrong, and it needs to be called out. Um, absolutely, absolutely, you know, free school meals, but healthy school meals. Um, and from what I've heard from some of my parents, you know, where I work in Tottenham, is actually the Jamie Oliver, Jamie Oliver initiative was brilliant, but actually I think a lot of school meals still remain quite unhealthy. Um, so it's healthy free school meals, absolutely. And then just to the point that you raised about thinking about, talking about good health. Um, and understanding that good health is an asset. It's an asset to all of us. Um, and I think, you know, the, often the problem, the conversation, we have this with obesity, the, but also the conversations about the NHS, is we're always talking about the cost of these mm. initiatives, the cost of these things, when actually there is a massive, massive benefit, a financial benefit, but also a benefit to, to all of us as a society and to community if we can invest in good health. You know, being in good health for for a long time allows you to contribute to society, contribute to economy, and contribute to a community. So it's a, it, is, it is an investment. If we invest in good health, it's a, it's a positive investment. So I think, as we've all been talking about, framing is really important here. Um, and health is an asset. That's the framing that we need to get correct. Brilliant. Thanks very much. Very empowering kind of vision there. Uh, Anna, what about you? Um, I'd just like to pick up on the, the free school meals point. Um, and obviously completely completely agree with you and it's absolutely fantastic that today there's going to be this this discuss, debate about universal free school meals for primary school children um, uh, and of course I very much hope that the Labour Party will commit to putting that into the manifesto as I think Sadiq Khan is is calling for um, I think it should be in secondary schools as well by the way I think it doesn't need to just be in primary schools in fact teenagers are often the ones when you look at the demographics they're the part of the population that are eating worse and are most vulnerable often to these really damaging food environments because they're starting to become a bit more independent and finding their own way in that difficult environment a toe in the door yeah exactly um, I think the problem that we've got is that in theory there's an that that there's an election in two years time fantastic if Labour is in a position to be able to implement that policy. Who knows? But we've got a very pressing problem here and now with actually large numbers of children who don't qualify for free school meals in England because they're not quite poor enough. So the threshold, probably not everybody is aware that the threshold is only £7,400 of annual income after benefits that allows you, you have to have less than that amount to be qualified. And so there are an estimated 800,000 children at the moment who are too, uh, uh, in poverty but don't qualify. And schools, are, teachers are starting to say, we've got hungry kids coming into school, we can't feed them, you know. Um, and so I think there's a real pressing issue here and now for the Conservatives, which is it's very, it would be simple and fast to change that eligibility criteria. They don't have to go to Universal instantly if that feels like it would just be impossible to implement on a very short time frame. But in the very least, let's make sure more of those children can, can qualify for free school meals here and now in the context of a massive cost of living crisis. Completely agree on the points on the quality. And I think one of the, the, bar the problems that we've got is that nobody actually knows what the quality of school meals are in England. Nobody's monitoring it. There's no requirement to monitor it. And so um, that all the time, you can, you can say to the Department for Education, so what's the quality of school meals? They just can't answer the question. And that's, so one of the things that we've been pushing quite hard, collectively, many of us have been pushing for, is for um, the DfE to start to put in place a better monitoring system that in and of itself will probably tra be transformative before you've even started to use the data. So um, 
completely agree on standards as well. Over to you, Dolly. Um, yeah, just sort of in, in response to some of the points raised, um, Jordan, your point on Chris Whitty, I'd be like, Chris Whitty for PM <laughs> would probably <laughs> solve a lot of these problems. Um, but c coming back to the, the point on the, the re kind of positioning and making this whole agenda aspirational, one of the challenges is we don't really even have terms to capture this agenda very well. And that is frustrating even as a researcher in this field. Uh, I try and avoid the term obesity, and yet I can't because people don't really understand what agenda you're talking about unless you use that term to talk about it without just saying food, because obviously there are all of the um, uh, you know, urban planning, physical activity components to this whole agenda as well. So the fact that we don't really have good words to describe and sum up this agenda is incredibly frustrating. And when we talk about diets and nutrition, they can have barriers as well in terms of people's understandings or again, the sort of branding around these terms uh, isn't necessarily helpful. So getting the right language and, and words, singular words to sum up this agenda um, is, is a kind of challenge I set to Frameworks Institute once upon a time. So hopefully we can get there together. Um, Sonia's point on, on health being an asset um, Winston Churchill, which might not be a relevant um, person to, <laughs> to reference at the Labour Party conference, but he once said that healthy citizens are the greatest asset a nation can have. Mm -hmm. And I think that that kind of concept has been in the um, minds of governments for, for centuries. And it's uh, frustrating that we still have to be making that case even today when we have had political leaders in the past go above and beyond of recognizing that. So how can we embed that so that it's once and for all uh, the case? And on the um, monitoring and, and school, uh, school food in particular, I mean, to give uh, an idea of the compliance level, 60% of schools, secondary schools are still not complying with school food standards, even though they're mandated. So even when you get the policies through and you actually that, get that kind of implementation, the compliance level isn't necessarily always met. And same with the trading point, there have been many policies on the trading side, and yet it's often talked about or health is seen as secondary or additional, or even in conflict with trading standards, which is even more frustrating. Um, but only 24% of those, of those almost 700 um, policies were proposed with any kind of monitoring and evaluation plan. Um, so the fact that so few policies are even proposed with the plan, let alone that being seen through um, when implementation may or may not make it um, also shows how against uh, the odds this whole agenda is when it comes to putting it through. But I don't want to, uh, to end on a miserable note and to say that there has been massive progress and we are moving in the right direction. The kind of policies that we're seeing proposed in the most recent strategies are the kinds of policy ideas that are might, much more likely to be affected, effective and equitable and are more tackling the environmental structural determinants than um, simply the provision of information for individuals. So we are moving in the right direction, but we just need to be calling for the seeing through by governments of these policies. Brilliant. I think that's a great note. I really wanted to come to, to more questions, but we have genuinely run out of time, so with huge apologies. But I'm sure there are panellists that will talk afterwards if there are burning, burning things. Let me sum up a little bit what we've heard today. So two words, I think, for me. One is frustration, the policy nightmare that Dolly talked about. This has been uh, an agenda that has put many through the ringer, but also aspiration, optimism. Um, there is a vision for health, for food, for obesity that is hugely aspirational, that the time has come for, as Jordan put it, that the conversations are there and ready to be had. And I think the challenge for us is to think about from what's already on the table and what we can go away and develop collectively and in conversation with many of the different organizations represented here, what's the equivalent of the kind of aspiration we've seen in other agendas in climate and industrial strategy for, for climate that's been so central to this Labour Party conference? What's the health version? What's the food version of that? The IPPR will be working on that itself. Um, we've launched our Commission on Health and Prosperity, uh, of which I'm pleased to say both Jordan and Kieran uh, sit on the commissioning board. Um, our commitment is really to bring together the wide range of civil society, trade unions, businesses, health leaders, to think through what that vision is. We'd love to join you in that journey. If that sounds like something you're up for, then let us know and let's keep the conversation going. A huge thank you to the panelists for coming. A huge thank you again to the British Heart Foundation, Obesity Health Alliance, Food Foundation, and Sustain for making the conversation possible. 
and a big thanks to everyone that's come, that's asked questions, that's listened. Um, it's great to see you and hopefully talk again very soon. Thanks very much.